Well, welcome in and welcome back to another episode of the Patient No Longer podcast. We are on location today with a very special guest, and it's great to have you with us, Dr. Mike. Thank you so much. I feel like I'm the patient right now, and you're the doctor. So, <laughs> Dr. Donahue, I, yeah, that's uh, maybe the tables have turned. I love it. Let's do it. Well, we're in the middle of Manhattan in, in the heart of New York City and uh, on location with you. You're a primary care physician. You're a practicing physician with Atlantic Health System, not far from here. And I think a lot of people will know you as a, as a familiar face to our listeners and viewers. You talk a lot about how small lifestyle changes can make a big impact on quality of life, on health outcomes. And uh, you've expanded your influence beyond the walls of your practice. You've got 23 million social media followers. Uh, I've certainly seen your videos. I think a lot of people have. And you use that platform. You focus on health literacy. You battle health uh, disinformation, misinformation. You do it in an entertaining way, which we really appreciate, especially from a doctor, I have to say. <laughs> Uh, you've been on CNN, ABC, Fox News. You've talked to notable figures, you know, Dr. Fauci, head of Google Health, Dr. David Feinberg. And now you're a part of NRC Health's Patient No Longer podcast. As a doctor, you do your research. So I have to ask, as you were researching NRC Health, what made you decide to partner with us? The reason why I went into doing this unique type of medicine, which we'll call like digital medical media, Okay. was because I would see all of the doctors that were popular in on television, on social media, and I just saw no matter what type of doctor they were, they ended up serving misinformation. They would misguide patients, they would have bad outcomes, they would start practicing bad habits, and I wanted to fight back against it. I could do that in my practice with my 30, 40 patients I would see in a day, but if I would bring the tool of social media into the fold, I can then reach millions of people. That was the goal. And we did that quite successfully. We've grown over the last six years. Our monthly viewership is anywhere from 50 to 100 million viewers. It's, it's incredible the amount of uh, success we've had on that front. And what is success? When I say success, I don't mean success by numbers alone. It, yes, it's great to get 100 million views but it's a hundred million views of evidence-based medicine. That's the thing I constantly have to remind folks because there's doctors that have gone viral before that have made successful videos. You think about the hosts that have had shows in the past. I'm not gonna name any names right. or Senate candidates, but they existed. Sure. In order to get those views, they had to give up their medical ethics to some degree. And we've never done that on the channel. And that's what success is to me. So when I was approached to make the discussion about NRC Health, I saw a lot of alliance, a lot of the same thought process of making medicine human again, focusing on the person sitting in the room in front of you as opposed to thinking about patients as numbers. A lot of the taglines that I saw in the NRC Health campaign were words I've said on the channel before. So I thought there cannot be a better fit for a corporation and an individual to work together. And I was extremely passionate about making it even a bigger and bigger scope of a campaign. Maybe our marketing folks lifted some of those things from you. We may owe you royalties. <laughs> I'm not I'm not sure, but I, I'm, I completely agree because in doing my research on you, I was watching things and looking at things and, and listening to some of what you say. And I was like, man, we are singing from the same sheet of music. And you know that we view everybody as a potential patient. And the way you've expanded your practice, so to speak, to those 50 or 100 million people is very impressive. One of the things that we absolutely agree on is this idea of human understanding. Every person has a story. There's more to it than the disease or the ailment or what have you. Healthcare struggles so much to look beyond just what's in front of us, what's diagnosable. So I want to, I want to tease that out from you, especially human understanding. What does that mean to Dr. Mike? Doctors like to have everything in an algorithm. We want to create systems, almost like engineers of the human body, if you will. And that's understandable because then we can give generalized advice. We can uh, create teaching pathways for students to understand how the human body works, what advice they should give as future medical professionals. But the problem is the human is imperfect. And we oftentimes lose sight of that in many avenues within the field of healthcare. One of them being trying to combine and force capitalism and healthcare to coexist in every avenue. It doesn't exist. There's so many ways that it can go wrong. Uh, for example, we've seen the urgent care model 
it can fill a gap. It can fill a need. Absolutely, there is a need for urgent care. But then when patients start using urgent care as their sole source of health care and ditch the primary care model, we see outcomes start to suffer. Um, whether we see telemedicine pop up at the height of the pandemic and help patients get access when they can't, and then it turns into a system where patients can pay to just get whatever prescription they want without actually ever seeing a provider. So we need to be very careful to not corrupt these very protected medical values that we have because those values are put in place to focus on humans. And when we think capitalism, when we think algorithms, we lose sight of that. And that's why the, the passion behind working with NRC Health has existed for me uh, from the beginning. Well, that's really well said. And, and as our podcast audience listens, we have doctors who listen. So, so let's zoom in. We've zo let's zoom in all the way to doctors because you've almost mentioned a few and you yourself are one. And with doctors listening, and, and honestly, whether it's a doctor, a nurse, or anybody, a nurse practitioner, whoever is providing care, as Dr. Mike, what would you say to them is one thing that they could do? Because they feel the onslaught of, I'm always told I need to change this and I need to change that. And I think a lot of them become very resistant to change. It's part of the problem. But what would you tell them is one thing that they could do in their practice or as part of that patient care that would start to make a difference? I think it would be to always put your human side first. It's very easy to put yourself with a white coat on, with a stethoscope around your neck into the superior person in the room, the one who needs to make the decisions, give the guidance and bark orders. And that's the furthest thing that creates success. You actually need to create a team-based approach with the person sitting in front of you. And you could only do that when you lead with a human first approach. So whether you're creating a new electronic health record as an administrator, or you're treating a patient by giving them an immunization. You need to treat them like a human. You can't yell numbers at them. You can't bark orders. You can't think about solely making reimbursement your sole goal with the electronic health record because ultimately it will fail. And when we think of healthcare, it starts with the human interaction. So like we constantly will say that word human because even my residents that I train in the hospital will frequently get lost and lose sight of the fact that they may not have a solution, but they can still help the person in front of them. So someone may come in and want a 100% answer that they don't have cancer. We can't give 100% absolutes in healthcare. So the resident feels helpless. But the, the goal of what I try to teach them is this is a human sitting in front of you. They don't need 100%. They need to be heard. They need to be addressed. They need to understand where you get your guidance from and how you make your decisions. And when you have that layer of communication that really coexists well together, that's when it's a successful visit. But that can only happen when you start treating folks like humans and not numbers. That is so, so well said. And I, I even think of a personal example. I had to go in for something. I'm playing sports into my 40s, which is a little bit of a mistake, I think. <laughs> but I'd had an issue. And my doctor knows me. He's a DO, not an MD. Okay. He always reminds me of that. Still don't really know the difference. But maybe you could show me later. But he, he says to me, you know, this is exactly what you have to do. He told me I have to go to this physical therapy. And I, I stopped him because he's, you know, he always seems like he's in a hurry. I think a lot of people feel that way about their doctor. And I said, why should I go to that physical therapy? And he stops and he goes, that's where my daughter went and they fixed her issue. And that's where I want you to go. And it was this moment that pierces through all the rest of our interactions because I saw him as a dad and as a human being. But sometimes I think physicians shield themselves from that and they've been given reason to do that and everything's electronic and all those things. I think that that's so important because it increases trust. And I want to talk to you about trust because trust is under siege everywhere, yes, especially in healthcare. And we've got misinformation, we've got disinformation. I want you to talk about the differences between the two, but I also want to know, do you see that as getting better in healthcare in the future? Are we in for a rough ride? What, what is the state of things in terms of mis and disinformation? I think it's probably incorrect to say that trust is being attacked. Okay. or under siege. Okay. I think that it is to some degree, but I don't think in the general scheme of things, that's what is happening in the majority. Okay. I think what's happening is we're fumbling trust. And a lot of times patients feel like it's the individual providers that are fumbling that trust and patients feel that they're being gaslit. Like when you feel that your doctor is rushing 
or someone feels like the doctor doesn't want to do a thorough workup when the doctor has already decided in their head that this isn't what's going on. They don't feel like all their questions are being answered or their calls aren't being returned as quickly as possible. And what I urge patients to see, and then on the other side of my advocacy work to fix in the systemic portion is that this is a systemic, less so an individual problem. Are there bad doctors? Of course. Are there doctors that are rude? Of course, it happens all the time. But the reality is the way the system is set up, it forces us to fail. It forces doctors to rush with patients. It forces us to stop looking at patients and look at the computer and type on the keyboard. Like the keyboard warrior is the modern doctor. And that's sad and unfortunate because if that was a successful model, we've all, we will, would have always been replaced by ChatGPT4. Sure. It's that easy because uh, you could just ask it whatever question you want and it's going to give you a pretty decent encyclopedic answer. Patients don't want encyclopedic answers. There's a reason why when they have a condition, they don't open the encyclopedia. They want to talk to another human, another dad, another mom, someone who has children who struggled with this condition. One of the best moments I have in a room with my patients is when I can relate to their problem by either bringing up another encounter that I had with a patient who has a similar condition and explaining that journey or sharing one of my instances of being diagnosed with that condition, having a similar condition, even losing my mom to cancer and going through that whole journey, explaining to them how I felt during it and my experiences. That's how humans bond. That is the part of our brain that lights up and gets us really activated because we almost function with a hive mentality. We're like bees and we like to work together. We, we'd rather, if left to our own devices, we'd, we'd rather cooperate than compete with one another. And if we could tap into that, that's where you get such good outcomes. But unfortunately, our system is set up in a way where the focus is not on that. The focus isn't on creating long-term primary care relationships. It's focused on quick fixes, miracle supplements. Um, how can we maximize profits and get patients out the door quicker? And in some instances, that could be good, but in many instances, patients are left behind and therefore are left struggling. It's interesting when you unlock that human side, it, it doesn't make any of your medical knowledge, your expertise, the reason people are drawn to you as a doctor, it doesn't go away. It just emboldens it. It, it, it br brings more bright light to it. it. It makes people think, wow, I can trust you. And you're a human. You're listening to me. Years ago, NRC Health asked a question about people who continue to go back to their doctor. They trusted their doctor. They were loyal to their doctor. We said, why? The top three answers were, well, one was they provide high quality medical care. So every physician saying, yes, absolutely. That's why I'm here. The other two are things you don't learn in medical school. They explain things to me and they listen to me. And those, you know, I think doctors look at those as soft skills, but for patients, that's in the top three. What do you think we can do to help embed that more in physicians who maybe the new generation that's coming up, the students that you see, are we teaching more of that now? Do we have hope that the next generation of doctors will explain things and listen to things and look at that as part of their duty? I think that the modern education system has incorporated, you, you asked earlier, actually, I'll back up, uh, about the difference between DOs and MDs. Yes. I'm a DO myself. Um, okay. My father actually went to medical school in Russia, MD, and then came to the United States and became a DO here. Okay, he so did he, both. He did both. Uh, I watched them go through the DO education as being nine, 10 years old, and I fell in love with the field, and that's why I eventually pursued it, ended up going to the same school, did one of those accelerated programs to do it as quickly as possible. Sure. And the reason I fell in love with it was because the DO model was focused, the DO model was focused on the entire patient. So yes, we learned diseases and systems and the cardio and respiratory tracts. We had all of those lessons. But every time we would learn about how the heart works, there was a module about how that impacts a person's life. How uh, does a person feel past having a heart attack? The rates of depression skyrocket after a heart attack. Things that pa patients were able to do before are no longer able to be done. So how do we build that back up? The importance of building that back up. So we've always thought with this holistic model, and that was a signature difference between DOs and MDs 10, 20 years ago. Okay. Now, that difference and margin is shrinking because the MD philosophy is now moving towards that holistic model. They're learning much of the same thing. They're, they're putting that emphasis on education, on making sure the patient is aware of what's going on. 
But because of the time uh, where we find ourselves in with the pandemic, a lot of the, the residents coming out throughout this interval didn't have as much face-to-face -face time with patients. So I know they're gonna have a slightly more difficult time because mm -hmm. of the lack of interaction. I can't begin to put a value on being in a room with a patient and the number of patients you have to see. And sometimes folks bring up the differences between advanced level practitioners and physicians. A lot of that comes from the sheer number of volume that we have to see in medical school, in our clinical hours, in residency. The length of that training really contributes to our comfort level, to our understanding of how to be better with patients. Okay. That makes so much sense. And, and I think that's refreshing to know that that's happening. And if you look at it from the patient or consumer point of view, so on the other side of that stethoscope, um, one thing that I think a lot of patients and consumers, and it, it shows in a lot of our research, is when they don't have that FaceTime with a the doctor, they go other places, yep. including to social media. And I think social media is used in healthcare. We know consumers use it. We know they trust some of the information, not all of it. But you have a lot of opinions about social media and if it's a vessel of health literacy or not. I hear people that get very down on it and say, oh, you can't trust anything on social media now. And I detect some cynicism in that. So I'm curious your take as a consumer or a patient trying to educate themselves. What's the future of social media? I think social media so far has been largely villainized for spreading harmful ideas, quote unquote. Sure. The reality though is it's a mixed bag and it's even more muddled when you look at it from different platforms. So certain platforms will put a higher level of social responsibility on making sure accurate information gets spread. Uh, YouTube being a prime example of that. They have now verifications for medical providers to show that they're actually a medical provider, not just wearing a lab coat. They do a really good job with community guidelines to prevent people from spreading misinformation about cancer and other medical conditions. Then you have, on the other hand, a platform like TikTok, which really doesn't care at all. <laughs> if it's viral, they want it on their platform. And I right. say that as someone who even posts on TikTok. Sure. I've, um, on my YouTube channel, posted a video contemplating leaving the platform. But then I thought, well, it's the av absence of evidence-based physician that also fuels misinformation. Right. So all of that is to say it's complicated. It's not as simple as villainizing the all of social media. We used to do that uh, when newspapers came out, we villainized them and they said, they're gonna ruin human communication because we're no longer talking to each other, we're gonna read newspapers. Right. We did it with radio, with television, with internet. Now we're at the age of social media. <laughs> Villainizing it is nothing of a solution. We have to figure out what it does well, what it does poorly, and figure out how to boost the positive effects while minimizing the harms, which is what we do in medicine every single day. That's true. So I've made it my mission to not only put out accurate info and use a lot of the same tactics that snake oil salesmen, that really successful marketers that are usually selling you BS miracle cures and use it to then market responsible content, but using those same strategies. And we found that to be quite successful because as you said earlier, doctors are afraid of showing their human side on social media. Yeah, They're worried about being labeled unprofessional. When I first started posting on social media, the constant feedback I would get is, doctors shouldn't post selfies. What are you talking about? <laughs> and then I thought to myself, like, does, is there something fundamentally different of a doctor as a human that we shouldn't post selfies? No. Yes, don't post selfies and misbehave in an operating room, which we've seen bad examples sure. of this. Yes. And it obviously is slightly more complicated than the average person because you have to respect patient privacy. There's a higher level of um, oversight on what you're posting online. Uh, your recommendations carry a higher weight than a traditional influencer would. But at the same time, you're allowed to have a family life. You should be able to go to the beach and take a picture in a bathing suit without someone saying, oh my God, this doctor is enjoying their life. How unprofessional. No, I, I think there needs to be some kind of uh, middle ground there. And I think consumers and, and patients of those doctors appreciate that. For sure. And they want more of that human side as, as we've discussed. And it's interesting because I see a bit of a paradox. Obviously, we have a, a national tool that uh, reveals consumer insights. So it's not just, I just had to stay at the hospital. This is me out living my life and we'll pierce that and ask them about healthcare. And Atlantic Health System uses that particular information. So it's a great connection we have. But when we go out and just talk to consumers who are awash in information, and you've alluded to this, I see a paradox. So I want your opinion on this. We have more information than we've ever had before. And it's at our fingertips. We can get it in an instant. 
And yet you have these ridiculous things online and you call miracle cures and just these snake oil salesmen. And as I'm looking at your videos, Dr. Mike, I'm seeing these fad diets and these ridiculous things that remind me of the National Enquirer when I was a kid. And you would think in this information era, we would be able to discard those things and patients, would-be patients can come in and navigate that. But it seems like it's all mixed up. And so what, what is your advice to consumers, patients, and, and maybe even providers on how to get through the BS, if you will, and, and find real information that can help patients? I think you have to create a list of trusted sources. And when you're thinking about large organizations like the CDC, the WHO, um, Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, these are institutions that have a wide variety of physicians. Uh, they're usually based on group panels of physicians that are all lending their voices to it. I would much rather trust these major organizations than an individual who claims to have all the answers. Like, why would there be some secret in the in the in medicine that these institutions would not want people to know, right. but this one person has figured out on their own? It just logically doesn't even make sense to me. Um, when it comes to social media and tech in general for the general public, uh, I always worry about it in the same way that I worry about capitalism and healthcare coexisting. In many instances, it doesn't work and you can't Uberize healthcare in many ways. But then there are some ways where you can create a company that is financially viable, but is also healthcare responsible. And a prime example of that is the business I have. We have a business that hires dozens of employees. We create healthcare focused content and yet we're a financially successful business. NRC Health, it's a financially successful business, but it is doing it in the right way. And I think if we can guide consumers to follow the good actors in this space by either holding each other up as examples, as we're doing here today, right. by making sure we're calling out bad actors, but not because we wanna attack them with ad hominem attacks, but instead we call them out for what they're saying incorrectly and explain where our logic comes from with a layer of transparency, that's how you get buy-in. That's how you create skeptics, not cynics. Because I want my patients skeptical. I don't want them to believe when some new magical product comes on the market that it's the solution to all their problems. But I also don't want them to disbelieve anything new. I want them to ask good questions. And I think that can be made possible with the use of technology and social media. I think that that's so true. And I think we have to adopt that or else uh, I, I'm... I worry about the future of healthcare, and I know that you do too. I'm going to lower the stakes for a minute okay. because in all of our new season of, of interviews, we actually have a little speed round. Okay. These, are, these are very fun, easy questions, maybe the easiest you'll get all day. Okay. Um, and we have a few, and we ask them all of every guest. Okay. So okay. consistency is I'm going to sit up for this. Okay. So there's only five. Okay. Coke or Pepsi? You can't ask a doctor that question. I said consistent. I have to stay consistent. Uh, uh, God. If you were to partake, not that you ever Coke. would. Coke. No, no, it's it's not a, th this is a thing about doctors. First of all, we're, this is probably bad for the speed round, but I think it's worth saying. <laughs> doctors are the biggest hypocrites because they give health advice and it's accurate health advice, but they don't always follow it. That doesn't mean <laughs> what they're saying is wrong. So it, it doesn't negate the strength of their recommendation. It's just, they may not always make the best decisions for themselves because they're human. So we're allowed to be human I've, and we're allowed to have Coke. I've seen doctors at conferences and buffets, yeah. so I, I believe you. That was also the longest answer we've ever gotten yeah, sorry to, about to Coke or Pepsi. <laughs> I'll keep going. Okay. Fiction or nonfiction? Nonfiction. Nice. Morning person or night owl? Night owl. I thought you'd maybe say both, like residency makes you have to do both. But That's all true right. too. Favorite, if you watch TV, favorite TV show of all time? Oh my God. Oh my There's, There's some good ones. Oh, can you give me a genre? Oh my God. No. Favorite. That, that's, you can't do that in a speed People round. People struggle with this one. That's so hard. Okay, what do I... Mm, I can't say any medical dramas because they're not... They're so inaccurate. They never do chest you compressions when people flatline. It's ridiculous. It gets me so mad. It makes me feel like <laughs> I might need chest compressions. TV. No, it makes for great <laughs> TV, but... Um, okay, best show of all time. You could do movie if you want to do movie instead. All right, Man on Fire movie. Man on Denzel Fire. Denzel Washington. Okay, very Dakota good. Dakota Fanning, Mark Anthony. Yeah, great, great movie. Great flick. Great soundtrack, great direction, great acting. If you thought the Coke or Pepsi one was ridiculous, just wait for the last okay. one. Okay. Because I have to ask this, and I was in Boston when I started oh asking this. Oh, my God. Oh my Boston God. or New York? 
Oh, that's so, New York. I told you, easiest question. The you get easiest all day. question I get all day. Let's go Yankees. So let's, even though I haven't watched baseball in like six years, because <laughs> I've been working too much. But growing up, so this is a funny story. Quickly, of course. Uh, I came to the United States when I was six. Okay. And I came in late 1995. Which, if you're coming to New York in 1995 as an immigrant, the thing that's going to bond you to the city at that time, Yankees. Yes. A lot of World Series championships. A lot of screaming at night Good watching. Years. Yeah. So that's. Uh, that will never change, even if they're consistently the worst team ever, just because of the childhood. Well, and and so there's a lot of people listening who are not in New York City. Um, and so they're thinking about it. I get this question a lot when I talk about consumers of patients. So I'm curious how you answer this question. Sometimes we hear, what's the difference between urban patients and consumers and rural? And I'll just give you a preview. Our data doesn't always show a lot of differences. Like rural Americans want good access to healthcare. They want value for what they spend. But what would you say to people who are listening in smaller areas, less populated areas of the country, what should they be doing to make sure that wherever they are, how small the town might be, that they get the best possible health care they can? It's very easy to run into this situation when you're uh, in an area where there's not a lot of medical care options to lose sight of the fact that there are experts with certain conditions across the country that mm -hmm. are available for consultation. Not every visit will require a physical exam. You can reach out to doctors that are experts in their own field that can review your blood work, your imaging, that can give recommendations even to your local doctors. So the problem that I see happen in both of these instances is those in a rural environment will oftentimes have limited to no choice. And then those in a large city like New York City will have too many choices. And the rule of the paradox of choice is true. Some choices are better than none, but more choices aren't better than some. Yes, that is so true. And I, and I think people can take that to heart. I also think about the differences in care that you see across different levels and, and different procedures. And I suppose I'm channeling some of those physicians who find me in a hallway and say, Ryan, if I could just stop doing X, I would be such a better physician, but I'm required to, or I have to, or patients want it. I have to ask you this, because you were recently on an appearance with Howie Mandel. And you were talking about how 100 years ago, we were still doing lobotomies and just ridiculous, terrible things. And now we have that perspective. But let's go 100 years in the future. Mm. So we're now in 21, 23, 24, somewhere in there, well into the future. What is something- Am I alive? <laughs> Did we find a cure you might for better than whatever me. I'm going to have at that time? What would we look back at that time to now and say, can you believe they did this? Well, first of all, it's good. They're going to say, can you believe they wrote notes? Because okay. that is the fact that we're doing that is just absolutely ridiculous. I like agree. the way I look back to paper notes and not being able, because I grew up in the era where it was hybrid or maybe even still on paper. And I remember doing my rounds and reading what the specialist wrote by hand and having no idea what it says on the paper. So having to call them anyway and bother them. And now I'm in the era of digitized electronic health records where that's a mess, it takes up too much time. It, the systems don't talk to each other. There's a million problems with it. So I think in the future, hopefully that just gets solved by some kind of magical recording system um, that I won't even begin to understand because it's so far away. We and, can't fathom yeah, it yet. Exactly. And then medically specifically, I think we're gonna look back at the entire process of surgery and biopsies as barbaric. Mm. Because I think in the future, we're gonna have much better imaging where we can potentially avoid doing many biopsies. And if we were to need to do a biopsy, we're gonna have lasers or some kind of other technology where we don't have to open up the body unnecessarily, leading to higher risks of bleeding. Um, if you're doing it with uh, the abdomen, potentially small bowel obstruction. So like these things that create problems like adhesions in the abdomen after surgery. And I think the reduction of surgery is gonna be a big thing in the future. I think that is music to the ears, especially of patients who worry about those things. Yes. And I wanna ask you this, I wanna ask you the last question as a two-parter. Um, and it's, let's focus inside the organization first, because you have a good understanding of what's going right and what's going on. You practice still, you're part of an organization. And so for those, whether they're a CEO, whether they're a director, I don't care if they're a security guard, whoever they are, they're thinking about what's going to happen in the future of healthcare and how can I make a difference? We have a calling in healthcare. Everyone does. And a lot of those people are as stressed out as I've ever seen them. 
Um, Dr. Mike Slabowski, who's CEO of Trinity Health, over 100 hospitals, he talks about how there's multiple headwinds, right? There's financial constraints. There's things coming out of COVID that are different. There's the workforce issues we've seen. And so you have all of this just making it for really rocky seas. What is a piece of advice you would give anybody at any level in healthcare who says, I, I don't want to be burned out. I want to make a difference. What's one thing I could do? I can speak to my own experience here. Um, I don't do anything revolutionary. I give the same exact advice that the CDC gives in 99.9% .9 of cases. I give the same advice throughout the pandemic that the WHO was giving. And yet when they publish some content, they get a hundred views and we get 10 million. What is the difference between what I'm doing as someone who's not educated in communications, not particularly amazing at speaking on camera, especially when I started this, it was impossible for me to do it. So what makes it possible that we do this so well, we are very profitable as a, as a industry as well. It's because we focus on doing the right thing. We don't care about the financials and we make sure that we continue to put focus on the medical ethics and humans in front of us. If you focus on these three values and you don't think about all of the other noise that's out there, you might not be successful in the very short six month term that people think about when it comes to quarterly reports and all of this, right. but you have to think big picture. And that is the new reality we live in. Um, whenever I talk to companies who are interested in building a digital strategy, they always want upside and growth all the time. It's impossible. Yeah. There's too much competition, there's too much noise, there's too many distractions, there's too many world events, the world is too interconnected. It's nearly impossible to have that continued growth forever. But if you're willing to consistently do the right thing, continually innovate, be passionate about what you do by putting humans and medical ethics first, there is no doubt you will have success in whatever part of the hospital that you work in. That's so powerful. And and I know from reading, it, it kind of as part of my job, I don't know how many consumers read the WHO's, you know, release on this or guidelines on that. I would much rather watch one of your videos. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think that's a compliment. And, and even if people get one thing out of that video, it's better than things they don't read or don't understand or don't, or don't know about. So for the last part of that, let's focus on patients. You know, NRC Health is very focused on patient education. One of our newest solutions is actually patient facing where they can give information about themselves as humans, what they're afraid of, if they have pets, what they want out of a visit, and it can go right into the electronic medical record. The doctor can see it even from afar. But let's say you bump into a patient. They're not your patient, mm -hmm. but they're nervous about healthcare. Imagine that. Of course. And you're on Who an elevator. <laughs> exactly. And you're on an elevator ride in, in New York City. So you get a little bit of time with them. And they want to know one piece of advice on how they can be a better patient. What advice would you give them on that elevator ride? First of all, I hate that I have to give them advice, that our, our, our healthcare system is so problematic that we have to give advice to <laughs> patients on how to be better patients. I You're agree. supposed to just come in and the doctor is supposed to just help, but unfortunately that's not reality. Right. So we have to think practically. The one piece of advice I would give patients is to really understand themselves before they come in for the visit. And that's kind of a broad answer, but more specifically what it means is understand what problem they're having, what risks they're facing, what are they actually afraid of, and what answer are they seeking to get? Because if you are able to come in with that game plan and want those questions answered, you will have a fulfilling doctor's visit. It's not enough to come in and say, I have a cough, because doctors, who are under all of these systemic issues, time constraints that we mentioned earlier, all the headwinds will potentially gaslight you because of those systemic issues and say, oh, the cough is nothing, you're good, go home, have some ibuprofen. Right. But if you come in, you say, I have this cough, it's getting better, I'm not really worried about it, I just wanna make sure I'm okay. And now the doctor says that, now you know what's going on. Or on the other hand, if you come in, you say, I know that I don't need antibiotics, but my friend recently was diagnosed with cancer and I just happen to be worried about that. Can you ease my concern or at least tell me how you think about this with cancer? Now the doctor's mindset is focused on answering your question right. as opposed to what they think should right. happen. So by knowing yourself, you will actually take charge of the visit and be able to guide the doctor, which again is ridiculous that we have to do it this way. But if you want good outcomes, you have to lead by uh, 
by that mantra. That's fantastic advice. I think so many patients, they are experts on themselves, but they check it at the door. They're nervous. They're afraid. Mm -hmm. Unless they bump into you in an elevator, they're thinking, <laughs> I can't talk about me. I've got to see what the doctor can do. But if they can take that moment, whether it's a minute before, a day before, a month before, and say, I need to think about and reflect and understand myself, that's great advice. And again, that's great advice for all of our listeners, all of our audience, both inside and outside of healthcare. Uh, this has been a fantastic conversation. We are so glad that you're part of the NRC Health family. And I just want to thank you so much for being on the Patient No Longer podcast. Thank you so much. I think it's a great opportunity to uh, share a little bit of the tidbits I've learned uh, along the way, both as a patient, as a caregiver, as a doctor, and now, dare I say the word influencer. I'm, I wasn't going to say it, but I think you can. Well, you know, I used to hate the term when folks would call me that. And then I came to the realization that doctors are influencers. They influence their patients to le lead healthy lives. Professors are influencers because they influence their students to do the best they can. Sure. Parents are influencers because they want to make sure their children are doing the best. So I guess if we're all influencers, I'll take it. I think you've earned it. I think everyone listening maybe feels at least a little bit like they're a patient of Dr. Mike. <laughs> and it's great to have you today. Thank My lawyer is going to be so happy you said that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much again. Seriously, great conversation. Very welcome. Glad to be a part of it. Mm -hmm.